Hello everyone and welcome to the weird, scary and horrible parts of humanity. Today we are looking into the longest unsolved murder in New Zealand, the 1969 murder of Jennifer Mary Beard. Beard was born in 1944 and initially from Flintshire in Wales, the daughter of Methodist minister Murray Reverend Beard. The family moved to Sydney in Australia and when the rest of the family moved back to Wales, Beard went with them and studied at Cardiff University, graduating with a diploma in education. She then moved to Tasmania in Australia in 1968 to live with her uncle, Dr. Trevor Beard. In Tasmania, she worked as a teacher at Campbell Town District High School in Hobart, the capital of Tasmania, and became a passionate walker and hiker, exploring the rugged countryside of Tasmania. Beard was described as an attractive, sweet-natured, clean-living and sensible person. Her uncle and father described her as a good-living, albeit naive individual. Her fiancé was Reg Williams, with the pair to marry in 1970. Beard arrived in New Zealand on the 19th of December 1969. She planned to eventually attend an alpine climbing course in Mount Cook. She was due to meet with Williams on the 5th of January 1970 in Wanaka, where the pair were going to go on a hiking and climbing tour towards Mount Cook. Flying into Christchurch in the South Island of New Zealand, she hitchhiked on the 29th of December 1969 from Christchurch down to the west coast of the country and stopped at a post office, sending her climbing equipment addressed to herself at Milford Sound. Even though hitchhiking is dangerous at the time New Zealand was, and in many ways still is, an incredibly safe country, with approximately 10 murders per year in the 1960s, and in Christchurch there was no murder in three years. She continued hitchhiking down through Arthur's Pass and Ottawa, arriving at the Franz Joseph Motor Camp on the 30th of December 1969. There she met up with three families from Dunedin in the motor camp and while they all prepared meals together she told them of her planned trips down to Wanaka and Milford Sound. People there were struck by her kindness and how friendly she was. The next day, New Year's Eve 1969, she was seen walking to the gate of the motor camp to hitch a ride. The three families from Dunedin left in a convoy heading for Wanaka where they were staying. At about 10 a.m. on the 31st of December 1969, one of the families drove to the face of Fox Glacier and saw Beard sitting in the passenger seat of a car with a man and was seen getting out of the car to take a picture of the glacier. She was then seen at numerous points on the South Island of New Zealand until about 12.30 p.m. by the family from Dunedin when she was last seen as a passenger in the car which was driving south down the state highway over the Lake Moyaki River Bridge. The gentleman that she was with was an unidentified man aged about 50 who was overweight with a prominent stomach and balding in a dust-covered green Vauxhall Velox which was approximately a 1954 model. It was reported that the car's registration started with AD. On New Year's Day, Bernie Mulcahy Chavez was playing under the Hast River Bridge with other children and saw some clothes, a blue and yellow dress with flowers, as well as a white pair of pants and a white bra. She told her parents, who in turn informed the New Zealand police, but the police did not believe her. With Beard reported missing by Williams, her image was plastered over all major newspapers in New Zealand, with her family insisting that she was not the sort of person to wander off. Police suspected that it was a homicide from the get-go, with investigation headquarters set up in Lake Moyaki and in inquiries in all areas between France Glacier and Lake Wanaka. Dr. Trevor Beard flew over from Australia. Michael Hines was on a holiday with his father in early January 1970 and jumped out of his father's car on the north side of the Hust River Bridge, walked down a track to go to the toilet and found a partially naked woman and ran back up the track telling his dad that there was a half-naked woman who the jury believed was sleeping. Later that day, the pair went to the Fox Glacier service station and then his father asked Hines what the half-naked lady looked like. The pair went to the Watara police station where his father made a statement with the policeman not questioning Michael. On the 3rd of January 1970 in South Westland, a family of five crossed the Hust River Bridge and an eight-year-old girl went to the toilet in the bushes. On her return, she said, Daddy, there's a lady lying near the stream. She hasn't got any clothes on. I think she's asleep. However, the family decided not to investigate and moved on. 
The Crossan family visited the Dunedin police station and told police that they had helped a man with his broken down car at the rest area near the northern approach of the Hust River Bridge, which was about 25 metres from her body at about 1.20pm on the 31st of December 1969, with the man driving a greeny blue 1953 to 1955 Vauxhall facing towards the river in a southeasterly direction. The car was having difficulties with the gear linkages. Then 13-year-old Peter Crossan described the driver as acting like a maniac possessed in a mad panic in his driving, wanting to get out of there. The car then drove down the Hust River Bridge. At around 1.30pm on the 31st of December 1969, the Vauxhall drove south from the rest area and visited the petrol station on the south side of the bridge, with the driver asking the attendant if the gear linkages could be attended to. By this stage, the Crossan family were heading north and encountered the vehicle passing them at full speed. The family stopped along the way at Lake Paginga, and when back on the road, the car passed them again, which meant that the driver at some stage must have left the road altogether, as the Crossan family had not noticed the car overtaking them. The Vauxhall then stopped at the garage in Fox Glacier at about 3pm, asking for the mechanic to look at the gear linkages, with the man appearing in a hurry but not nervous with a large quantity of camping equipment in his car. Edward Watson of the Bruce Bay store also attended to the gear linkages. Additionally, one of the families from Dunedin, the Scandrit family, had returned from Monica to Dunedin and saw on the television that Beard was reported missing three weeks after last seeing her in the Vauxhall around Hust and telephoned police to inform them. The aforementioned Vauxhall matched the car that Beard was last seen in and police moved in on the northern span of the Hust River Bridge and on the 19th of January 1970 found the partly clad body of Beard which was found on a gravel track hidden in bushes with her feet pointing down the stream. The heat and humidity combined with the rise and fall of a river, with the water making it up to her thighs, animals, mosquitoes, sandflies, and birds, meant that the body was an advanced stage of decomposition, with very little left apart from the skeletal remains of her body and some flesh, which made the investigation much more difficult for police. A scene guard was set up as it was getting dark, and the next morning police returned and found that she had been murdered in a sexually motivated attack. Attack. Her body was identified by Dr. Trevor Beard. The head was covered by the bush. A pair of track pants were neatly rolled down to beneath her knees and her hiking boots were still on her feet, but the clothes of her upper body, including her tartan shirt, had been ripped apart with buttons missing and were tightened around her neck. The right sleeve of her shirt had been ripped apart while the left sleeve was still intact. It is believed that she was killed between 12.30pm and 1.30pm on the 31st of December 1969. Her rucksack, traveller's checks, camera and other items were not found and there was evidence that she had been sexually assaulted. It is suspected that if the driver had murdered Beard, he would have scrambled up the bank and wrenched the manual car into gear and in the haste of getting back onto the road, the gear linkages in the old car may have become untangled, leading the driver to visit numerous gas stations in order to get the gear linkages fixed. It is believed that once back on the road, the driver would have realised that he had left the camera, traveller's checks and the rucksack of beard in the car, drove off onto a side road and hid the items, probably in one of the fast flowing rivers with the items never found. A search of the items by the New Zealand police continued until the 31st of January 1970, but they were never found. Police searched from Franz Joseph to Lake Hast over four weeks, searching every side road for beards items. The camera was of particular importance to New Zealand police, as there was one photograph that Beard took at Franz Joseph, which, as accounted by witnesses at Franz Joseph, had the Vauxhall and the person driving the Vauxhall in the photograph. Lead detective Emmett Mutton believes that Beard's gear was dumped somewhere between Waita and Parena. Mitten said in a statement to the coroner that he believed that Beard was attacked and killed when she went to relieve herself. Mitten believes that she was most likely picked up by the Vauxhall shortly after 9am at Fox Glacier, believing that she was safe. She then is believed to have gone to the toilet under the Hast River Bridge when she was attacked by the man driving the Vauxhall, with her shirt ripped open at the point of the attack and tied around her neck, which caused her death. This led the person to panic and harshly 
overcurring the gear, breaking the gear linkages, which led him to seek assistance from the Crossan family before proceeding to the Hust garage. During an inquest into her death in Auckland in 1971, investigators stated that they believed that Beard had been strangled to death, but a lack of evidence meant that the cause of her death could not definitively be determined, although police were satisfied that she had been killed by the person driving the Vauxhall. The discovery of Beard's body led to an unprecedented search in New Zealand and one of the largest manhunts that, until this day, the country has ever seen, with army officials, many of whom were back from the Vietnam War, and policemen performing checks of 25,000 Vauxhall cars, with the predominant colour at the time of Vauxhall cars in New Zealand being blue and green. Between 50,000 and 60,000 people were interviewed in relation to Beard's death, but no arrests were ever made. Police had an artist rendering of a man believed to have been in the Vauxhall and offered a reward of $3,000, a third of the New Zealand median wage at the time, or about $50,000 today, for any information related to the disappearance and murder of Beard, but this came to nothing. In an interview with the New Zealand Herald in 2019, then 83-year-old Mutton said that he believed that the murderer was from outside of the west part of the South Island of New Zealand, as well as a timber worker. Worker. There were two primary suspects in the murder of Beard. One was Gordon Bray, a Timaru truck driver who owned a dark blue Vauxhall, which had work done on it shortly before the disappearance of Beard, and was aged 51 at the time of the disappearance of Beard. He was in the area at the time of Beard's disappearance on a fishing trip. Two witnesses who fixed the gear linkages of the Vauxhall picked Bray out of a lineup. Bray was interviewed by lead investigator Emmett Mutton. He was questioned on the 22nd of January 1970 for six hours at Timaru Police Station with his voxel subjected to a government analysis. However, there was insufficient evidence to arrest Bray, and in a 1988 interview with the Timaru Herald, he said that he had gone down the highway the day before Beard's disappearance, on the 30th of December 1969, and had fitted the description of a wanted man and had a similar car to that which Beard was last seen in, and insisted that he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Indeed, Bray's vehicle was blue and in good condition, and the Crossan family were adamant that the Vauxhall that they saw was green. While he admitted to giving rides to multiple hitchhikers, including two girls, as well as a female and male hitchhiker, at the time, he denied giving Beard a lift. However, 100 metres from where Beard's body was found were a man's singlet and trousers, and in the trousers were a screwed up receipt issued by Timaru Motors in Bray's name. Then 13-year-old Peter Crossan and his father picked Bray out of a lineup, and in a 2019 interview with the New Zealand Herald, he said that he was 90% sure that it was Bray that he saw in the Vauxhall at the Hust River Bridge rest spot. Bray died in November 2003 in Timaru. Many believe that he took the secret of Beard's death with him. His nephew Sam Leary reiterated his uncle's innocence in a 2019 interview with the New Zealand Herald, stating that he was a gentle giant and described him as a quietly spoken individual. Mitten has said that he is quite sure that Bray is the culprit, however he insisted to the New Zealand Herald that he has never shut down other leads. A second suspect is Reginald Mervyn Wildboar. Wildboar was described as a strange and different man who made many women feel uncomfortable around him, with many finding him creepy and they were cautious around him. His former supervisor at the then Electricity Corporation of New Zealand, Ivan Beckris, described him as a snooper who exhibited predatory behaviour. Born in 1930 and married to Margaret Wildboar, who would die in a car accident in 1973. In 1969, Wildboar was a roadman for the Westland County Council, within the area where Beard disappeared and lived in Fox Glacier, where she was last seen at around 10am on the date of her death. He later moved to Oemata. Wildboar was one of 50,000 to 60,000 people interviewed by the New Zealand police at the time of Beard's death, with a statement dated the 8th of February 1970 given to police. However, in the statement, he noted that he saw someone from Christchurch in Fox Glacier outside the post office who had taken a woman with a buttoned-up tartan shirt and had a similar hairstyle and build to beard. 
At the time of the original investigation in 1970, New Zealand police were satisfied that there was not enough information linking Wild Boar to the murder, and he was cleared and eliminated within their search. In the early 1970s, his then wife, Glennis Henderson, who passed away in 2013, reported to police that Wild Boar had murdered Beard. While an investigation took place, this did not come to anything. In December 1989, his best friend Peter Johnston noted that around the 20th anniversary of Beard's disappearance, Wild Boar was in tears for half an hour, but at the time Johnston did not connect the pair. Wild Boar also never wanted to get a passport and never travelled overseas, with Johnson noting that this was most likely because he was scared of the police. His friend Ian Molloy, who was also from the west coast of New Zealand, informed the New Zealand Herald in 2019 that in mid-June 2003, Wild Boar broke down crying and said that he had done something really bad and that he had killed Beard. Additionally, Beckris told Molloy, as well as the New Zealand Hill in 2019, that he believed that Wild Boar had killed Beard. What sparked Beckris' belief was that he worked for a friend of his in the early 1970s as a local barman, and while he was discussing with some friends the murder of Beard, Wild Boar got agitated, changed colour, got up and left, with his friend noting that Wild Boar was the one who murdered Beard. Moreover, Brent Smith, whose mother Lorraine Smith was having a relationship with Wild Boar from 1970 until mid-1972, noted that he would begin crying for no apparent reason, and at one stage Wild Boar told Smith's mother that he needed to speak to Mitten, but did not say why. Brent Smith's sister, Rosie Webb, said that come Christmas and New Year, Wild Boar would change and would move away from the Smith family for a few days, and during this time period he would go quiet. Lorraine Smith said to Rosie that she suspected that this was related to the murder of Beard, due to the correlation between him acting up and Beard having been murdered on the 31st of December 1969. He also told Webb that he needed to speak to Mutton. He also said that he had gone down to Dunedin to speak with Mutton but said that he didn't have the courage to go into the Dunedin police station and see Mutton. While Smith and Webb said that Wild Boar was a good person, they would not be surprised if he had committed the murder of Beard. His daughter, Pam Rufin, insisted that Wild Boar was not a murderer. Had an alibi at the time, although when interviewed by the New Zealand Herald in 2019, she could not remember the alibi and also stated that he did not own a Vauxhall. In 2002, police began investigating sexual offences against Wild Boar, and on the 29th of January 2003, police spoke to Wild Boar at his home in Otemata, and he denied any offence. After further investigation, on the 3rd of June 2003, police spoke to him and informed him that they intended to charge him with sexual offences against children. He was to come at 1pm on the 19th of June 2003 to Oamara Police Station with Wild Boar a resident in Omegata. This was so that he could be charged and appear in court where he would be released on bail. When he did not arrive at 1.30pm, police telephoned his house and at 2pm, police left for his home to find him dead with his suicide planned all along. He had marked the date, the 19th of June 2003, on his calendar with a big red X and referred to it as D-Day. Johnson admitted that it was the best thing that could have happened. People were glad to see the end of Wild Boar and that had he survived, he wouldn't have lasted long in prison. Hines, who originally found the body, is a friend of Molloy, and Molloy eventually told Hines that Wild Boar had confessed to the murder of Beard. Hines tried contacting New Zealand police, but received a call from a private number telling him to leave it alone. He admitted in a 2019 interview with the New Zealand Herald that he does not trust the New Zealand police. However, the New Zealand police began investigating Wild Boar back in February 2002, more than one year before his suicide. On the 21st of February 2002, a police informant from Otemata, who was living in Christchurch at the time of the murder of Beard, was told by others as well as Wild Boar's ex-wife that he had committed the murder. However, even though this was filed and forwarded to New Zealand police in Christchurch, they did not investigate it and no further inquiries were carried out. 
Other suspects, albeit with less substantial evidence, are Ron Hunter, who was named in a 2008 article by Investigate magazine as a suspect. Hunter left his job with money owed to him shortly after the disappearance of Beard, indeed as soon as police began releasing pictures of the suspect. In 2012, private investigator Cindy Roberts made a film about the disappearance of Beard, and in the movie she stated that someone confessed to the murder in 1970 before being committed to a psychiatric hospital. Who this person is and why they confessed is unknown. In 2004, the movie Hitchhiker, which analyzes the case of Beard, was released. In 2012, Dunedin police reopened the murder of Beard, but did not find any new evidence. Police noted at the time of reopening the case that with the passage of time, it is very remote that this murder will be solved, and indeed nothing came to fruition from Dunedin police reopening the case. With the murder of Beard having occurred more than 50 years ago, the relatives of Beard seem to have come to some solace not knowing who her killer is, with a relative telling the New Zealand Herald in a request for an interview. From my own personal perspective, it happened such a long time ago, and we have all grieved and moved on. To relive the experience is to open a wound which healed years and years ago, and to do so serves no useful purpose. This is despite Beard having siblings who are still alive in the United Kingdom. If you have any information about the unsolved murder of Jennifer Beard, please contact the New Zealand Cold Case Team on 0800 265 32273. Thank you for watching. Please do yourself a favour and hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to inform you when new videos come out. Also, why not hit that like button and leave a nice comment? It helps more than you know and your support is truly appreciated. Until next time, stay awesome, stay classy, be kind to everyone you meet, have an amazing day, and remember the truth is always more interesting than fiction.